Good evening for everyone. I'm Jaime. He is Arthur. Uh, I'm a master's degree student in computer science. He is an undergraduate student in physics engineering. And we talk about computational neuroscience and cybernetic systems. It's our lab. Um, we we'll talk about some perspectives and challenges in, in this area. So this is the summary. We start introducing you some preliminary concepts uh, regarding uh, computational neuroscience. After, uh, we'll show some discussion around neuroscience and computer science, mainly in artificial intelligence. Uh, after, we show you our lab, CONSIS, and we are going ongoing research. And finally, uh, we show you about our uh, Latin American con uh, workshop in computational neuroscience. So, uh, what is computational, computational neuroscience? It is a relative newborn branch into neuroscience, which has an important role in trying to understand the brain uh, using uh, some technological application. For that, computational neuroscience uh, use two approaches. A bottom-up approach, it means from neurons to behavior, understanding the human behavior and how the human thinks, uh, through the use of modeling the neuron synapses. And the, another approach, the other approach is opposite side. Uh, the thumb-down approach is from behavior to neurons try to understand the neurons and the cells through behavioral experiments. And the main goal of computational neuroscience is explaining how the electrical and chemical uh, signals of the brain are used to represent and process information and behavior. Then, for t uh, to reach this goal, uh, computational neuroscience uses uh, mathematical and computational models uh, of cells and brain circuits, which are able to reproduce um, some, or reproduce and explain some structures and function of the brain. Of course, these models uh, must be uh, biologically plausible and based on experimental data. This experimental data could be acquired uh, from different levels and different techniques. Of course, uh, we have since microsco microscopic level, it is a molecular and cellular studies, until a systematic level, it is mean using more uh, by behavioral studies. But what is the strength of computational neuroscience? It roots from its intrinsic nature, which covers several disciplines, knowledge, and methods, in, from neurobiology, psychology, cognitive science, physics, mathematics, computer science, and philosophy. For this reason, mainly, computer science uh, have, has several discussion around uh, several uh, knowledge. Uh, one of these discussion is the relationship between artificial intelligence and neuroscience. Because due to the growth of machine learning and some related techniques, neuroscience has accurate some important advances. Uh, for example, the use of some machine learning techniques to analyzing uh, or reduce the dimensional of large volume of data from experiments or from data sets. Uh, also, the processing and analyzing of image, medical image, uh, using some technique uh, like uh, machine learning in, in, in processing image, and also for prediction, some disease in this image. Then, 
In, uh, in the other side, we have also the contribution of neuroscience for uh, artificial intelligence. In this case, um, artificial intelligence has integrated some neuroscience knowledge to build models more robust and realistic. Uh, so then we can look how artificial, in artificial intelligence can be used to give some answers to questions around the mind and the brain. Um, let me just uh, add to the idea, uh, artificial intelligence uh, helping neuroscience and neuroscience helping artificial intelligence um, can bring us back to the slide uh, where preliminar preliminary concepts of bottom-up and top-down approaches, um, all this enhances uh, the importance of uh, interdisciplinarity. Uh, to achieve results. Uh, what I mean is, if artificial intelligence worked uh, on its own and neuroscience were another isolated island, um, it would be so different to look at these uh, fields of research nowadays. It would be completely different. And predictions for the future would be um, I don't know, I, I, I just couldn't imagine. Yes, um, the progress in understanding the brain, uh, it's, it's still limited. So we believe that it only become true with both deep theoretical discussion and mutual collaboration between different disciplines and approaches. Uh, you can look in this paper, for example, if a neuroscience spirit artificial intelligence, where you can look a good review about what is the discussion around uh, computational uh, neuroscience, in this case, neuroscience and artificial intelligence. Uh, indeed, this, this review was uh, the main motivation for us to start to study this area. Uh, in this case, uh, it was born our lab, CONSIS. Um, okay, so computational neuroscience and cybernetic systems, uh, CONSIS, um, is our newborn uh, research group. Um, all of these uh, we showed you so far were the main motivations we had um, to build a research group. Um, and so taking advantage uh, of artificial intelligence methods and techniques as well as wide possibilities offered by powerful computers, CONSIS focused on understanding the human behavior and, it, and its interactions with intelligent systems. Uh, through of cognitive neuroscience study, computational modeling, and brain computer interfaces. Um, the research topics, um, the top five are the first five listed computational and cognitive neuroscience, neuroscience um, brain-computer interface, computational modeling, eye tracking, and human-computer interaction. Um, we also um, use some time uh, working on attention and working memory, uh, neuropsychology, neuroengineering, and uh, rehabilitation, human factors, in engineering and design, neuroergonomics, Cognitive ergonomics, ambiguous computing, and engineering psychology. Um, our team, the three of us, um, is uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Dante Baroni, um, Jaime, uh, and myself. Um, so, Dante um, is a researcher and supervisor. Um, of the postgraduate uh, courses computing and computer science and education uh, for a long time. He has worked um, many years and he's a leader of the intelligence, robotics, and artificial vision research groups. He has worked uh, on many projects um, with uh, universities abroad um, and it's, he's currently part of a really nice um, cooperation uh, project with the University of Oslo in Norway. 
Um, unfortunately, he couldn't be here this evening because he's in a meeting. But. Okay, um, my current research area is focused on physiological factors uh, related to attention and memory for understanding several cognitive systems such as mental world of uh, working memory uh, mental resource in staring and visual text. Uh, I have used uh, EEG, EOG, electrocopography, eye tracking, and virtual environments. Uh, my topic of interest are computer national neuroscience, human factors in engineering and design, cognitive economics, ubiquitous computing, brain computer interface, human computer interaction, and virtual reality. Um. I'm Artur, um, born in 97. Uh, I'm currently for, uh, fourth semester undergraduate in engineering physics program uh, in Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul. Um, and I've always believed in the importance of interdisciplinarity and applicability uh, of research. I'm not saying that theories aren't important, I, I just feel like uh, I just feel you should always be concerned about how to take advantage of what you're researching. And um, my areas of interest are simulations, uh, computer simulations, and, well, computational neuroscience. Okay, we are talking about our ongoing research. So then we... we have explored topics about visual scanning and working memory. Uh, working memory has been defined uh, as short-term memory, which is in share to manipulate and processing input information for making decisions. Uh, in this case, uh, the MBAC tax uh, has been used to asset uh, the working memory and join with EEG Several studies have carried out for understanding the memory and attention. Uh, one of them was carried out with Max Planck Institute uh, for Biological Cybernetics. Uh, in this experiment, uh, was studied the role of visual, att visual attention into the working memory. Uh, here, the research question was, how do we remember information across more than one source of information? Uh, the stimulus we can, we can look was two MBAC tags, the dual MBAC tags in, in each side of the screen. And uh, then the user uh, was uh, set up to performance the both uh, and back tax uh, at the same time. Then we collect the EEG and EOG data to process uh, how, how many attention uh, he plays in one side and the other side. Try to look in uh, how we, we collect uh, data and process this data and retain this data because the impact tax uh, you usually use the working memory to retain um, some, uh, some data to process and making a decision. Um, our research uh, can be really about creativity um, and the experiments uh, require data to be con collected uh, and we have to analyze the data afterwards. So some creative work uh, could be uh, interaction with external stimulus, uh, playing games such as chess, and advertising studies. Um, one of uh, the research areas our group works is the eye tracking. Um, so this notebook, uh, Toby, is a really good eye tracking device we have uh, and we plan on using it to achieve some results really soon. Um, here we have an example of an experiment. 
Um, this is a piece of art called Moonrise Over the Sea. Um, Jeremy uh, was tested. Uh, he stared at this picture for about 30 seconds. Um, and Toby analyzed his eyes to see what was going on. Uh, before we show you the results, I just, uh, I think it's important to talk about two keywords. They are saccades and fixations. Uh, so when we look uh, at, at any specific object, what happens is you, you keep focusing your sight at a spot for no longer than uh, 0.4 seconds. Uh, these are fixations and your eyes, they keep sort of jumping to different spots, also very quick, and these sort of jumps are called saccades. So, well, it's involuntarily happening all the time to all of us and that's how we, um, that's how our system works to analyze. Well, so this first image is the same, the same piece of art. Jaime looked at it for 30 seconds and these uh, green dots are the fixations. The, the size of the circles, uh, it means uh, how many time I spend looking at point. Um, this next one shows us the scan path. You can see the, the arrows going from fixations to fixations. Um, you, can, you can say the arrows represent the saccade. Um, and well, he started up there, went all the way down, and went back. So this is the scan path. Um, and this last one is the heat map. Uh, which also shows us how much time he spent looking at a certain region um, of the... Uh, it's uh, necessary to point out how important it's eye tracking is to psychology and in, indeed in neuroscience uh, experiments because it's through the eyes the main input information. Then uh, we try to uh, carry out many experiments about visual attention and working memory and we're right now looking to build a uh, own eye tracker in this case it's using uh, a camera uh, you can yeah um, we well when I was motivated to work with Jamie we didn't have our own eye tracking device yet so um, we tried to build our own, uh, which was not tested yet, but we estimated it works. <laughs> um, you you can see, <laughs> um, all you need basically is um, a headset, an eye cam, a world cam, uh, an infrared um, LED, a USB extension cable, and a piece of exposed negative film. Uh, the negative film is because you want to work in the infrared spectrum of wavelength, not in the visual, uh, visible wavelength. Um, this is how the software works better, so that's the reason. But it's so important because this device is wearable, so then you can uh, explore new uh, experiments looking at the world because the uh, uh, disadvantage of our current eye tracking is you only uh, can put the user and looking at the a screen of the monitor. Uh, then with this wearable device, uh, you are free to look in any part of the world. Then obviously uh, you can uh, perform uh, some advanced experiments. Another approach that, uh, we are exploring is neuroergonomics is ability in graf graphic user interface. In this case, we are using this approach for monitoring and controlling a robot. Um, the most common um, be, uh, way to the machines communicate with us is through the graphic user interface. 
this uh, graphic user interface determines uh, the usability of this, determines how easily is the interface to use and how easily uh, we can learn uh, how to use it. So then, new approaches are looking in designed advanced interface, taking account the psychological uh, state of the user. Uh, those usability can be talked uh, in cognitive terms to design the new, uh, the new guys, uh, and then these guys uh, obviously uh, will be more flexible and it did take account the mental resource. Uh, for this reason, uh, we have proposed an interface where the cognitive load of the user is measured to know when uh, show some information related to fouls uh, of emergence. Because when we are inspecting um, some interface and then happen some emergence, the user uh, normally it's disturbed. Then we we trying to design an adaptive user interface so then the user can look at the emergent states more uh, quiet if without uh, overload the user with some information that's not uh, useful for these states. Uh, thus, we aim to reduce the mental workload made by the interface. This, is, uh, this work will be shown in the workshop in, the next, uh, in this month. It is the word, an adaptive user interface based on psychological text and text relevance. Uh, and finally, another um, work uh, we are go ongoing researching is for my master thesis. Uh, we are working in modeling uh, the vest vestibular ocular reflex. Uh, using EOG data and recurrent neural networks. In this case, uh, we have uh, as input the head velocity of the movement. The vestibular ocular reflex is the compository uh, movement of the eye when I move the head. For example, when I move uh, my head for the le uh, left side, my eyes automatically uh, uh, move it to the right, to opposite side to fit the image, uh, I, what I look. Then we are trying to modeling this system to reproduce the EOG data of the movement of the eye. Uh, we are trying, of, of course, it's so difficult, but we are some advancements uh, using the eye tracker data uh, as input, and then the output is the e EOG data. And finally, we are some publicity space. We talk about our Latin American workshop on computational neuroscience. This uh, workshop is will be held at the uh, Plaza San Rafael Hotel in Porto Alegre since the 22th until 24th of November. We have three main um, topics uh, in this workshop, in this edition. Uh, neuroscience, neuroengineering, uh, and artificial intelligence. We cover several topics into the three main areas, and we have eight keynote speakers, uh, four of them international, uh, which will talk about robotics, uh, like the professor, uh, oh, here, it's good, sorry. It's good, the name, um, and the name of the, of the world. Okay, so then we have eight keynote speakers, and he, uh, then they, we are talking about robotics, medicine, neuroscience, biophysics, and neurology. We are here to another four uh, speakers. And we have some offers for you that are available. For groups, uh, for five or more people, we have some discounts. 
and we can look on our website to the complete information about it. So thank you very much for your attention and for the invitation to Professor Sophia. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Jaime, Arthur. And uh, we have some time for questions. Just, uh, I have a comment. Um, Abigail yesterday spoke a little bit about these eye movements and how they work so as to establish uh, 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 immobile, a uh, known movement of the, the view, the, the representation of what we are doing, uh, how we do to to not see everything moving all the time. No? But this is not what you were doing. You were, were trying to calculate uh, another movement. It's not this, uh, this correction of... The correction of the eye movement when yeah, you... Yes, it's, it's a kind of correction of the eye movement. Yes. But, but, it's, but it's not the same. But it's correlated to, to what she was speaking about. But it's a correction. Yes, it's a correction. In the, the all um, calculus you, you are doing. Yes, yes. We, we are trying to modeling using the current pathways of the vestibular ocular motor. In this case, um, we're trying to, to do a minimis minimalistic model around uh, this, this is the vestibular ocular mo uh, motor reflex the the whole the whole pathway then we have several neurons we are, are not uh, we notice that this this orange it's like a recurrent network then we try modeling this uh, vestibular ocular reflex uh, system using the recurrent networks. This is a machine learning approach. So then we have uh, the input of through the nucleus, okay, this is a, a hard name, but hits the input of the head um, velocity. Then this translates this head velocity to eye movement through this uh, neurons. So then we try to modeling this, this information, and the output, of course, is the eye movement. Uh, horizontal and vertical, but we are only modeling the horizon, horizontal. Uh, just a small question. Uh, Toby has its own software to analyze the data, or you do it uh, your yes, own? We are uh, uh, building it, uh, modeling with own so software. Ah, okay. Of course, we are using some libraries. Of uh, is not a uh, uh, starts from zero. It's only using some libraries and it's employing t uh, the current models available in the, in the literature. Yeah, no problem. problem. No, uh, because I understand that you must correct your eyes when you move the head. Yes. Yeah. To fix. To try to, to, to try to fix your the... view in a one direction. Yeah? yeah. But at the same time, you still are moving your eyes. Is that right? Yes, yeah, right. And there is a pattern in this movement. Yes, because. Uh, All Every, every time there is the same pattern. Oh, every time it's the same pattern. The because, same pattern. Yeah, because it's employed, not the saccades movement, like the natural movements of the eye. It's an involuntary uh, movement. So then it, when you try to look in and some 
try to do a fixation, then you are unable to do it because it's automatically a uh, compository movement of the eye. Then it's, it's, it's so interesting. Yes, uh, some people is looking at it to discover some disease, like uh, Parkinson, for example, because some people have no teeth reflection. And it's, it's, it's all another motivation for doing this model. No other question. Thank you very much both. And um, thank you for coming, for accepting the no, invitation to be invitation. here today. And uh, we will close the colloquium. Uh, I thank you very much for, mainly for the ones that are still here. <laughs> And I hope we have another one in uh, no, no, not so long uh, time. Uh, espero que nós tenhamos um segundo, um terceiro coloque ou algum outro evento sobre filosofia da neurociência uh, em breve, ou seja, uh, que não não se passe muito tempo. Tá? Agradeço a todos pela presença e até um próximo evento. Ah, sim, e não esqueçam da oferta que foi feita de participar do evento na URGS, né? e de, de procurar o Jaime para levar grupos de, de cinco pessoas. Eu queria só somar a, a esse convite. Né? Por, por um acidente biográfico, eu fui convidado a fazer é, alguns pareceres para os os temas que foram apresentados no, no simpósio, que tivessem alguma relação com filosofia, eu fiquei muito impressionado com duas coisas. Primeiro, pela qualidade dos trabalhos que vão ser apresentados, pelo menos os que eu vi, e segundo, pela, diversa, pela organização do evento, extremamente, vamos dizer assim, é interessante o modo como foi estruturado, o modo como as pessoas davam os pareceres, o modo como as pessoas enviavam as submissões, etc. Né? Um processo super rigoroso e muito bem controlado. Então, meus parabéns para vocês, parabéns pelo Dante, e né, aqueles que têm interesse, de fato, sim, vocês viram a gama de assuntos que esse evento vai tratar, é enorme, e tem coisas interessantíssimas, e especialmente interessantes para quem tem interesse por filosofia. Tem coisas lá do arco da velha, como se diz assim, do ponto de vista do interesse para a filosofia. Então, eu renovo né, o convite que vocês fizeram. É, de fato, um evento importante e impactante. Parabéns. Obrigado, Obrigado. Veja... Muito obrigada por, por quem se inscreveu à distância e que está aqui presente. E, e vejo vocês, então, no próximo, próximo evento. Tudo bom?